Vaclav Smil is Bill Gates' favorite author. The University of Manitoba professor is also the Dean of Energy Transition Scholarship. He's written dozens of books and gotten hundreds, hundreds of articles about this. And his motto is evolution, not revolution. And that means what he said argues is essentially energy transitions are 50 to 100 year processes. They don't happen overnight. And the average change per year is really quite small, maybe a couple of percentage points. But there's another wrinkle on this, and I'd like to illustrate it using the technology adoption S-curve, because what that shows is that the first two or three decades of an energy transition are, there's really not much change at all, because the technologies are new, they're immature, uh, they're not competitive, but they show enough promise that entrepreneurs uh, keep working at them and investors keep putting capital into them. But then along about the well, third decade, uh, it, that's the disruptive one. And this will come as no surprise to you that the 2020s are essentially the disruptive decade in this energy transition. And so the question arises, how disruptive will this be for electric vehicles, for the electrification of transportation? It's a question I get asked all the time because we haven't seen them take, I mean, they're only about 4% of global sales today. Why should the oil industry, for example, uh, be worried about you know, peak oil demand? if the growth is that slow. Well, I wanna draw on five or six interviews that I've done over the last little while to illustrate technologies and, and advancements that argue for a very rapid acceleration of uh, electrification of transportation. And then I wanna conclude by talking about the interview I did with Bloomberg NEF about its 2021 electric vehicle outlet. So let's talk about the first the first innovation, which is batteries. So batteries have been getting a lot of attention lately. So I talked to Dr. Peter Harrop of ID Tech X in London, and he uh, argues that there are going to be thousand mile batteries by 2030. They're going to be, some of them will be solid state. They'll be able to charge faster. They'll be uh, safer because they won't have a liquid electrolyte. And probably, and I also talked to uh, Dr. Uh, James Frith from Bloomberg NEF, who's uh, their uh, heads up their battery storage, their energy storage division. And he thinks that in the 2030s, the, uh, a battery pack for an EV, which averages around $137 now, and 100 bucks is the threshold for when EVs will reach price parity with internal combustion engine cars. So we're kind of in that range. Uh, he thinks they're going to hit $30. So imagine how cheap electric vehicles will be not that long from now. So batteries are undergoing a revolution of their own, and it's driven by economies of scale. There's large-scale adoption now on the, on the utility side. Uh, homeowners are buying them. All of that is driving down the, uh, the cost of batteries and, and making them better. And of course, we have clever engineering as well. So watch out for batteries. That's going to be a major, major area of change in the next five to 10 years. I want to talk about mobility as a service. Now, I first interviewed Tony Siba, who uh, was uh, had released a seminal study about this in 2017, and he said that there was going to be a disruption of a factor of four to ten times, and the cost per mile of using mobility as a service would fall so cheap that no one would have would own a private vehicle anymore in the United States. So what's a mobility as a service? Well, basically think of it as a robo-taxi, uh, an autonomous electric vehicle that you call on your app, just like you would an Uber, and it shows up at your house and it takes you to where you wanna go. And it's basically a buck or two or some low amount of money. In some cases, maybe it doesn't even cost you anything because advertising pays for your trip. That's how low costs will go. Now, that was agreed with a little bit of derision in 2017, and uh, Siva argued that this would all take place by 2030. Well, he's a little bit behind on the timing, but mobility as a service is here, and we're already seeing it in limited uh, applications in places like Las Vegas. You can take an autonomous shuttle from the airport uh, to downtown Las Vegas, and a number of companies, including like GM's Cruise, are planning to introduce a, a, to roll out mobility as a service in selected cities in the US in like 2025, 2024. So mobility is a service here. And I talked to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, James Jeff of uh, ID Tech X, and he thinks that it'll start in the suburbs and it'll follow basically the same adoption path 
as uh, ride hailing services like Uber did. And by the, uh, the end 2030, 2035, uh, mobility as a service will have, will have a big dent, put a big dent in sales of private uh, automobile sales, whether they be electric or, or gas, and uh, it's going to, uh, going to have a big impact on how we get around in urban environments in particular. So that's, num that's uh, number two. The third is the cost of driving an electric vehicle. Now, in 2019, the Canadian Energy Regulator did a levelized cost of driving estimate. So that means they took, they compared uh, a gas engine car and an electric vehicle, and the cost per kilometer uh, uh, over the course of that vehicle's lifetime. And what they found is that using 2018 data is that the EV was slightly less, uh, the, sorry, a car, an EV car was slightly less than a gas car, and an EV truck was slightly higher than a, uh, than a gas truck. Uh, and all of that has changed now, of course, because costs have fallen so dramatically over the last three years. We just saw the Ford F-150 uh, Lightning uh, debut and it, its purchase price uh, on the base model in the U.S. will be lower than the gas-powered uh, version. So that means that the levelized cost of driving, the cost per kilometer, will be much, much lower. So the it, it, the purchase price uh, it will probably won't catch won't won't be uh, price parity on this on the lot with uh, between EVs and and gas-powered cars till the mid 2020s. But the cost per kilometer, if that's how you buy a car, is already much lower and favors the electric vehicle. And that's only going to get uh, favor of the EVs more and more and more as we get into the late 2020s and well into the 2030s. So it's just a better deal. Now, the, the fourth thing is the, the switch in the automotive industry from uh, internal combustion engines to electric vehicles has happened much quicker than anybody expected. I mean, it's, it's almost like somebody threw a switch and the, uh, the big automakers like GM and Ford and Volkswagen and so on jumped from or announced that they were moving uh, from, uh, you know, to, to electric vehicles. And it's uh, the transition will take place fairly quickly. It'll be mostly done for many of them by the mid to late 2020s and probably 2030, 2035 for the, for the laggards. So once the industry makes the decision that it's going to move to electric, then you can bet that the internal combustion engine uh, is not long for this world. Now, there's another thing here that uh, we don't pay a lot of attention to, but it's a big deal when it comes to adoption of new technologies, and that's value. It's not about, always about cost, but value plays a big role. And I wanna illustrate that with the example of the iPhone. So when the iPhone came out in 2007, there wasn't anything like it. And within, oh, I think it was uh, eight or nine years, there were 7.5 billion of them of, on the planet, but it's a much more expensive phone than say a flip phone. So why would people so quickly adopt a new technology like that or new product, uh, even though it costs a, a lot more and you have to, your plan has, you have to pay for a lot more for data and so on. Well, the reason is because, you know, if I have a flip phone, it probably could do maybe six things, you know, a call and take photos and be a calculator and a few others. And whereas a computer, uh, sorry, the, the uh, smartphone uh, that I have in my pocket does thousands. I mean, it's almost uh, uh, infinite the number of things it can do depending on the apps and what I need it to do. And so it is a little mini computer that happens to make cell phones. And it's, uh, I use it in my business. I use it for home life. I spend a lot of time on, on my phone as most people do. And it has a lot of value. So people will pay more if there's an exponential increase in value. So what do electric vehicles bring? Well, we're starting to see, you know, for instance, mobility as a service would be a tremendous uh, improvement uh, in cost, but also in convenience. You can imagine for seniors, for, for uh, families who don't want to have a car, you know, in urban environments where you're maybe living in a, an apartment building. I mean, there's, all, there's a big segment of the population that would benefit from them. For those who do want to buy electric vehicles, take a look at the, the Lightning. It's, uh, it's got... Uh, uh, Four wheel drive because it's got uh, motors front uh, engine, uh, sorry, electric motors front and rear. It's got a huge front uh, frunk on it. So it's got lots of storage space you don't get with a, a regular pickup. You can power your house with it for three days. I mean, there's all sorts of things an electric vehicle can do that uh, a regular uh, pickup truck can't do. And so that adds value. And it's not necessarily the case in all cases that an electric vehicle provides more value right now, but the value proposition for electric vehicles is growing. That's the key thing here. 
and it, it'll be much better next year and it'll be much better in 20, than that in 2025 and by 2030, the value proposition in my opinion will be overwhelmingly in uh, uh, favoring the electric vehicle. So it's that growing value proposition that really in, in, I think is going to drive, be dr driving the uh, electric vehicle sales. So let's talk about that for a moment. So I interviewed um, Dr. Uh, Nicholas uh, Solopoulos from Bloomberg NEF, and this year they had to do a major revision on their projections because the industry is changing so rapidly and the, up, uh, the sales are growing so rapidly that they had to do a major overhaul of their uh, uh, estimate, their forecasts, their predictions, because, which are you know, kind of considered the industry leading. And what they found was they had two scenarios. So in their uh, economic transition scenario, by 20, uh, 2040, 70% uh, of new car sales will be electric vehicles. So essentially at that point in the game, you can say that the internal combustion engine is dead and electric vehicles have, are, are now the dominant uh, technology in transportation. E-bus sales uh, will rise to 83% of new sales by 2040. And already China, I think they have four or 500,000 e-buses. And we're seeing major uh, transition to electric buses in North America. And Europe is, is uh, even ahead of, of North America. So transit and public transportation is going to go electric as well. And then there's all sorts of other things we don't think about, like two and three wheelers, e-bikes. There's 260 million of them on the planet. And they're growing rapidly, especially in the developed countries uh, in Europe and North America. So all of that combined in the net, in the sort of their base case, you're going to see by 2040, uh, the uh, electric uh, transportation will be overwhelmingly the dominant uh, form of transportation. But there's another case, which is their net zero case, where basically uh, by the time you get to 2040, uh, almost all of the, uh, all sales, 100% of sales are close to it, are, are electric. And the, uh, the fleet, the existing global fleet is quickly turning over and becoming electric as well. So that by the time you get to 2050, there's essentially net zero emissions from the uh, ground transportation sector. Now that uh, we're not close to that yet, according to, to uh, Dr. Salopoulos, but uh, government policy, it would be very important. And, and it could, if governments are as committed as they appear to be today, uh, and they enact more aggressive uh, climate policy that favors uh, electric transportation, uh, then we could get to a net zero and we could see electric uh, vehicle sales uh, grow at an even uh, faster rate than we have than we're expecting in the in the base case. So overall, uh, Bloomberg NEF thinks that we are well on our way to electrifying transportation, could be even faster. All of the trends are in that direction. And even though they're, you know, um, the developing countries, particularly Asia, uh, still have a thirst for oil, that is very quickly going to uh, fall by the, the wayside. And electric is, uh, is essentially going to take over. And it's because of these disruptions, but not just these disruptions. I've given you five or six here based on interviews I've done recently. There are all sorts of other innovations, smaller innovations that are going to be pushing electric vehicles. So now the, if somebody asks you uh, when electric vehicles are, or if they're going to take over, now you have an argument for it.